Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and I am building upon the animated battle map I did last year featuring the assault on Mary's Heights. In this video, I'll be demonstrating how the armies came to Fredericksburg and the urban warfare that took place in the town. After the Battle of Antietam, Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia marched back into Virginia, leaving George McClellan and the Army of the Potomac in Maryland. Once into Virginia, Lee spread out his army with Thomas Stonewall Jackson's wing in the Valley and Longstreet's wing stationed around Culpeper. Abraham Lincoln was tired of McClellan's stalling and slow movements, even though the general had made plans for invading Virginia and pushing on to Richmond. The Army of the Potomac began moving into Virginia, passing to the east of the Blue Ridge. Abraham Lincoln took a risk and replaced an army commander during an active campaign, replacing McClellan with Ambrose Burnside. The new commander had suggested to McClellan that a push towards Richmond through Fredericksburg would force Lee to come after the much larger Army of the Potomac, and now that he commanded the army, he would implement this plan. The Army of the Potomac would form near Warrington and New Baltimore, then proceed to Fredericksburg, where they would cross the Rappahannock River. As Burnside waited for Lincoln's approval, he set about reorganizing the Army of the Potomac. He would create three grand divisions with two infantry corps, cavalry, and artillery in each one. The right grand division would be commanded by Major General Edwin Sumner and be composed of the 2nd and 9th Corps. The left grand division was given to Major General William Franklin, containing the 1st and 6th Corps. And the center grand division would be commanded by Major General Joseph Hooker, containing the 3rd and 5th Corps. The Reserve Grand Division contained the 11th and 12th Corps. In preparation for his move to Fredericksburg, Burnside dispatched Captain Ulrich Dahlgren with a small cavalry force to approach the town and check on the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad that ran between Aquia Creek and Fredericksburg. Dahlgren performed great service in testing the fords along the Rappahannock at Fredericksburg and even went into the town, dispersing the small Confederate force stationed there. Then they headed to the northeast to inspect the railroad. In this instance, Dahlgren went beyond his orders and burned a couple of bridges in that area, railroad bridges that Burnside hoped to use to supply his troops from Aquia Creek. Nevertheless, on November 14th, Burnside got his plan approved by Abraham Lincoln, although it was with reluctance on the side of the president. On November 15th, Edwin Sumner's right grand division began their march with the 2nd Corps in the lead. On that same day, to confuse General Lee as to what Burnside's plans were, a cavalry and infantry force launched an attack on Confederates at Rappahannock Station. Lee began to think that Burnside was going to force his way across the waterway and attack his dispersed forces near Culpeper. Longstreet put his men on alert in case of Union forces heading south toward their position. Burnside also ordered a feint to occur at White Sulphur Springs to further confuse the Confederate forces and make them think that the Union Army intended to push south. On November 16th, the other two Grand Divisions began their march. The left Grand Division pushed towards Stafford Courthouse, and the center Grand Division marched to Hartwood. On November 17th, Lee was still uncertain about Burnside's disposition, but he quickly found out. The Second Corps was at Falmouth by now, a difficult march over muddy roads, but the blue troops persevered. Union cavalry excellently screened the movements of Sumner's men, blocking both Confederate infantry and cavalry from breaking through their screen. Colonel William Ball of the 15th Virginia Cavalry came into contact with 2nd Corps troops as they approached Falmouth. By engaging with the enemy, he determined that a large body of Federals were approaching toward Fredericksburg and quickly informed Lee. He began evacuating some citizens who were willing to leave. The town housed 150,000 pounds of tobacco and a stockpile of cotton bales. Ball burned the cotton bales and threw the tobacco into the river. But to his dismay, the Federals did not pursue across the river. He had destroyed the material for seemingly no reason. But he had no way to know that the town was not in immediate danger. It was now November 18th. Lee wagered that Burnside's ultimate destination was Fredericksburg, so he performed two important actions. First, he dispatched two of Longstreet's divisions, one under Lafayette McClaws and the other under Robert Ransom, toward Fredericksburg to block a possible crossing of the Rappahannock River. Next, he sent Jeb Stuart north to see if the Federal Army remained near Warrington. Stuart reported that it was on the move to Falmouth, and this confirmed Lee's suspicions. 
Fredericksburg was the ultimate destination. Stuart and his cavalry performed hard duty over the next couple of days, operating behind Union lines, engaging with their federal counterparts, and capturing prisoners and what supplies they could. Lee did not feel comfortable positioning his troops at Fredericksburg for a major engagement. He believed the heights on the north side of the river superior to those on the south, so he wanted to bring on an engagement on the North Anna River, where he would have a better advantage in terrain. So the rest of Longstreet's troops were to march to the southeast. He also called on General Jackson to link up with the rest of the army. At first, Jackson refused, saying the Federals were reinforcing near Harper's Ferry, possibly for an attack down the valley. But Lee convinced him that the larger Union threat at Fredericksburg needed his entire army. Sumner had watched a cow cross the Rappahannock River in about three feet of water and asked Burnside permission to cross with his forces to capture the town. Burnside insisted that the pontoons would arrive soon and he would cross when they arrived. Burnside was unaware of the problems Halleck and others were having attempting to get the pontoons to the Union Army. By November 19th, the left Grand Division was at Stafford Courthouse, and the center Grand Division was at Hartwood. The pontoons were considerably late by this point, partially because no one secured their transportation at many locations. Plus, the horse flesh needed to pull the wagons were partially wild, and the bridles arrived disassembled which ate up more time. Davis convinced Lee that the crops between the Rappahannock and the North Anna were more important than stringing Burnside out in an advance, so Lee countermanded his previous orders and put all of Longstreet's infantry on the road to Fredericksburg. On November 21st, Burnside sent a message to the mayor of Fredericksburg, Montgomery Slaughter, asking for the town's surrender. The mayor refused to surrender the town. Lee intervened and assured Burnside the town would not be used for military purposes and pulled troops out of the town by November 23rd. While all of this went on, Lee's troops filed onto the heights south of Fredericksburg and Jackson began to leave the valley. Stonewall did think he could do greater service in the valley like he had earlier that year, but the well over 100,000 troops of Ambrose Burnside could easily overwhelm the roughly 40,000 men that Lee possessed at that time. They traveled south to Newmarket and suffered greatly for want of shoes. Some of the men wore leather moccasins, but in the wet November weather that plagued both armies, the pieces of leather became brittle when the men attempted to dry them. They decided to throw them away rather than risk more harm to their feet. Then they traveled east to Madison Courthouse, then across the Rapidan River to Orange Courthouse. Jackson then traveled ahead of his troops to Lee to inform him of the unit's progress. By December 1st, all of Jackson's men were at Fredericksburg, having marched 175 miles in 12 days, including two days resting at Madison Courthouse. With Longstreet guarding the heights, Lee placed Jackson's troops at the fords to the east of town to protect his army from a possible flank attack by Burnside. After consulting with Abraham Lincoln, Ambrose Burnside decided on a frontal assault, believing that the Confederate center would be weak since many of Jackson's units were downstream guarding the fords. He gave the order for the pontoon bridges to be built, the 50th New York Engineers, the 15th New York Engineers, and the U.S. Engineer Battalion began their construction job at 1 a.m. on December 11th, while infantry units protected them from the banks. Above them, on the heights north of town, 147 artillery pieces aimed their guns to protect the builders from enemy infantry and artillery. General William Barksdale commanded his Mississippians in the town, and the division commander, Lafayette McClaws, assigned them the task of hindering the building of the pontoon bridges. At 2 a.m., Barksdale sent a message to McClaws informing him that work had begun. At 4.30 a.m., he received another message from Barksdale, stating the bridges were being constructed. McClaws fired two artillery pieces in rapid succession, the signal to the army that the enemy was crossing the river. The Army of Northern Virginia began to take their battle positions. The first major Confederate volleys occurred at 5.15 a.m. in an effort to stop the engineers. Rebels hid in buildings and behind well-constructed barriers to deliver devastating volleys into the blue troops. As the day wore on, the pontoon bridges downstream made headway, but the ones closest to the town faced a stalemate from the Mississippians across the river. The engineers had lost an incredible amount of men by midday, so it was decided to move infantry across the river in boats. The 7th Michigan, with the 19th Massachusetts supporting them, rode across the water at about 3 p.m., with rebel bullets smashing into the wood and flesh. 
Miraculously, the Michiganders made it across and began fighting with the Mississippians. The boats returned to the other side to transport more across. When the Michiganders got across, they were ordered not to form into battle line, but to rush to the rifle pits of the enemy and take over the barriers concealing the rebel infantry. Major Thomas Hunt divided his storming party into groups of five to ten men, each of which would identify a building used as sharpshooters' nests, surround it, and neutralize it by killing or capturing the troops inside. With a bridgehead created by the 7th Michigan, Burnside ordered the 89th New York to do the same downriver. Both units cleared away any resistance in their front, and as the Confederates retreated into the city, the Federals pursued. The Michiganders and New Yorkers fought doggedly to hold on to the ground they gained and neutralized many of the threats to the engineers. Plus, the 147 artillery pieces aimed at the town sent many rebels running. The engineers extended the pontoon bridge across the river. The heavy toll taken by the engineers did not stop their persistence in getting the bridges completed. As they built, boats loaded with soldiers crossed the river to help hold on to valuable ground. Colonel Norman Hall, the commander of the brigade fighting through the streets, had been at Fort Sumter when it was fired on by Confederate forces on April 12, 1861. He returned to his home in Michigan to help recruit for the Union war effort. Now he commanded the 7th Michigan and the 19th Massachusetts in urban warfare on the streets of Fredericksburg. The ingenuity of the Union officers and rank-and-file soldiers cannot be overstated. They adapted to a style of warfare unknown to them and succeeded. Before long, most of Hall's brigade and Colonel Joshua Owen's brigade crossed the river. To strengthen the Union foothold, Captain Macy of the 20th Massachusetts organized his men in such a way to form a large rectangle in order to fire in three different directions. This pushed back a great deal of Mississippians. Owen's regiments adapted to the situation as well and dispatched companies of men to infiltrate the alleyways and search houses for any enemy activity. This slow progress continued until nightfall when General Lafayette McClaws ordered Barksdale to withdraw from the town.